Hello, my name is Jim. Hello. I sincerely thank you all for attending this intervention on my behalf, this intervention. Um, Richard, thank you for facilitating this intervention. Um, but before you go any further, I, I admit it, I'm a biffaholic. <laughs> I tried to kick the habit. I tried to do it myself. I couldn't do it myself. So I went on Wednesday nights, they have these Biff Watcher meetings, you heard of those? They have Biff Watcher meetings where innovators go every week and they pay $8 and try not to weigh in. <laughs> those didn't work, so in the, in the frozen food aisle, if you want to curb your appetite for, invitation, for innovation, they have these Lean Six Sigma cuisines. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of those, but the Lean Six Sigma cuisines, uh, they will curb your appetite for in innovation, but they won't make it go away. <clears throat> so I did try some of this Bifferet gum. Maybe you've heard of Bifferet gum. The Bifferet gum, uh, the theory there is you, you can't chew gum and talk about innovation at the same time. Uh, also not true. Uh, thanks to the genius of Larry Houston, who I think was here last year. Is, he, is Larry here this year? Probably not here. But thanks to the innovative genius of Procter & Gamble's, uh, I was able to try Bifto-Bismol. <laughs> now, Bifto-Bismol, the theory there is if you take it rectally, it will stop diarrhea of the mouth. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't, and there are some nasty-ass side effects, I can tell you that. <clears throat> so another innovative product from Procter & Gamble is the Bif patch. Now, the Bif patch has some promise. Uh, unfortunately, it has to be worn over your mouth. So <laughs> there is some downside to solving the Bifaholic problem with the patch. Um, so I was at about the end of my Biff rope, and uh, thank you for this intervention. Now, it's not my first intervention. Uh, my previous intervention happened when I was just a young pup starting out in business. I worked for a big company, and I started looking at the pieces, much as people talked about this morning. Sometimes it's not new pieces, it's the same pieces arranged differently. And I started looking at them, and I said, wow you know, we could make something different with these pieces, or with, you know, if we shape these differently, it would be a different product. And I started making noise in the system, and soon they scheduled a innovation intervention, a management intervention, if you will. I'd like you to close your eyes and get a graphical image, bring your left and right brain together and think of the term management intervention. <laughs> yeah, you got a graphic yet? Left and right brain come together. Think of invention with a big turd in the middle of it. Intervention, that's what management intervention is, okay? <laughs> if you want to stop innovation, you get management to intervene, okay? And I had a management innovation, um, and it, it went something like this. Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. You probably don't know most of the people in the room, so sit down and let's get started. Oh, not there. No, not with us. Why don't you sit over there and tell us about your latest innovation? So I sat down, and I was all hepped up. I was a young pup, and I started talking about, hey, we could do this, and we could do this, and we could do this. Well, there's always a facilitator at an intervention, and in a management intervention, that facilitator, his job is to end the meeting just as quickly as he can, but he lets you finish first. Now, most interventions, you're surrounded by people who care deeply for you, and they tell you, they go first, and they go, Jim, we care deeply about you, and we want to help you through this troubling time. Not so in a management intervention, because nobody gives a crap about you. They just want this intervention to end so they can go back and do what is on their schedule. So I tell my story, and I say what we can do. Well, everyone in the room keys off the facilitator. So you finish, and you hold your breath, and it's all going to go one way or another based on the facilitator's first comment. He apparently thought I had suffered a blow to the head and had amnesia because his comment was, who the hell do you think you are? Well, I was confused, but apparently the other guys broke the code very quickly and soon started bombarding me with, you know, your invention needs investment, your invention needs more information, your invention, you know, your investment, your invention needs guaranteed sales. What, what's the return on investment? Where are the people lined up with money in their fists to give us for this invention? You know, there's risk. There's always a lawyer that says, hey, risk. This has got risk, or there's uncertainty. And that ended my first innovation calibration. I was an idiot. And these were some smart, some bitches in this room, I'll tell you. What they were looking for 
is an idea that didn't need any investment, had no uncertainty, well, there was no risk associated with it. There were people standing at the door with large sums of money just waiting to give it to them. Okay? You don't need a room full of smart people to make that decision. That's what we call a no-brainer. Okay? However, what they did have in common, urine, urine, urine. That's what, the, that's what they did to my idea. Okay? So, but I didn't feel bad. I tried it a couple more times. Well, if you try it a few times in a company, there's only two options for you. One is leave, but that wasn't an option for me. I had no skills. So I stayed, <laughs> and you only have two choices. You only have two choices. And by the way, if you do it a number of times, they mark your personnel file. Bad influence. Because you take people off what they're supposed to be doing to talk about what they could be doing and what new ideas you have. So they stamp your personnel file, Biff, you are a bad influence in the organization. <laughs> well, once you get the Biff stamp, you have two choices. You can go into innovation rehab. Close your eyes. Think about a graphic for innovation rehab. Those of you that are not right brand, just think MBA. <laughs> okay? Innovation rehab means you've been sent to get your MBA. Now, I wasn't that lucky. I also stayed with the company. So the only other option, and there is one of these in every company, by the way, is the Innovation Protection Program. <laughs> you guys got an Innovation Protection Program? That's where the innovators go to stay with the company and hide. They want to blend. Okay? You have to look like the other people. So I blended. This was many years ago when I was a pup. I decided I better blend um, because I don't have an MBA and have no skills, so I can't go anyplace else. So I became a butthead. <laughs> but this needs investment. But this has risk. But we don't know everything. But what if somebody's done this before? But oh, what if the competition's got the jump? But, 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 but. So I became one of those. And over the years, if you're a butt boy long enough, I, was a, I became a vice president. I became a... <laughs> senior vice president, I became an executive vice president, I even became the president <laughs> of the company. Well, not far along the way, they took the stamp off and they put company man stamp. They go, this guy's a company man. He does exactly what we want him to do. He stopped being a bad influence. So, over the years, I dropped innovation and I became the Count of Money Crispo. Okay? <laughs> So I went from a young pup that had a lot of innovative ideas to a company man. And that's what it was all about. Then I get this call from Saul Kaplan. And he goes, Jim, there's a Biff Summit. I go, a Biff Summit? How cool is that? A bunch of bad influences come together <laughs> for a meeting. I go, I'm there. It's like an innovator's happy hour. I show up, and there's a cop talking about cops thinking differently about law enforcement. There's politicians talking about the state of Rhode Island thinking about itself as a profit law center and thinking of it innovatively and applying some science and technology and some research and combining the gifts of the, the citizens to solve some problems that can then be scaled outward. There's teachers talking about educating students in a different way. There are leaders here talking about leading people in a different way. There are authors. You got one of their books. Uh, Bill will be here tomorrow. Excellent book, Mavericks at Work. His book, Bill Breen, other people are writing about thinking differently about innovation. Last year, there was even a disc jockey, if you recall, talking about the music industry, thinking about the music industry differently. It was invigorating. I swear to God, it really was invigorating. So, Last year, I spoke. I said I had two points. My first point was I hate pyramids. I suffered in a pyramid. I was a pyramid practitioner for 20 years. I know how to play the pyramid game. The other was at our company, we innovate every day. Okay? I had two points, 15 minutes. When I stopped, everybody stood up. Sure, it was break time, but, <laughs> but I, I was so pumped up. I went home and I told my wife, I got a standing ovation <laughs> for my story. So 
I'm milling about after the thing, and I'm talking to people, and I'm chatting it up, and this muscular guy comes up to me, and he goes, hey, maybe we could step outside. Not the first time my mouth has gotten me invited outside. <laughs> In fact, my mouth broke my nose once, but that's, a, that's another story I'll tell you some other time. It was Bill Taylor. He said he was inquisitive. He asked a lot of questions. He never said but. He just asked a lot of questions. And he, then later he contacted me. He said, hey, can I come down to Right Solutions and play that game? I go, sure. He came down. He played. Next thing you know, big article in the New York Times, Right Solutions has solved the code of innovate every day in a company. Well, since then, it's been a rocket ride. And now there's a ton of companies out there starting their idea engine. And things are moving nicely. And everything's good. But the second point I made, and I ne nobody asked me, but they asked me last year. They said, hey, this pyramid thing, how do you do it when everybody comes from a pyramid? You know, when it comes to right solutions, you go, no pyramids here. And they go, well, so what do you got? So the question was, how do you get people to appreciate that there's a better way than the pyramid way when all those people have come from a pyramid? And as you might imagine, my partner Joe Marino and I, if we make a game out of innovation, the way we break down the pyramid legacy is to make fun of it. So Joe and I sing songs. We sing parodies about pyramid organizations. And we both were in one. We both, we both did this in one for years. Um, and we call them tomb tunes. Um, and those tomb tunes are meant to simply make our people comfortable with the fact that there's a better way than the, than the pyramid. So if you can go someplace other than the pyramid, you tend to be less uncomfortable because everybody relates to a box, you know, when, especially the engineers. You know, if you're going to hire an engineer, he wants to know, where's my box? So we don't put people in boxes. So um, I'll ask my partner, Joe Marino, to come up here. And we, nobody outside the company has ever heard these tunes. I'm going to do one for you today. If you feel like it, you can sing along. If you want to tap your feet, tap your feet. If you want to clap your hands, clap your hands. If you're white, pick one and focus. <laughs> <laughs> this tune tune happens to be called, In a Box, There's No Room for Two. Or not. Acapella. <laughs> You could dance too if you Same old, same old. What is a guy to do? I'm half crazy. Can't turn my back on you. It may be a bloody carnage. But I have an advantage, and you'll get beat because I cheat in a box. There's no room for two. Right back at you. Old friend, old friend. You thought I was true blue. <laughs> Two chums buying, both had an interview. There is only one position, so I messed with your ignition. <laughs> what could I do? It's me. Are you in a box? There's no room for two. <laughs> next box, next box. How is a guy to gain? There's less boxes. As you go up the chain, they call it a competition. It's time for demolition. <laughs> Spot 
I'll nab your back. I'll stab in a box. There's no room for two. What would we be without props? <laughs> Sad news, sad news. I hear that you've been sacked. It was risky, but into your computer I hacked. Now there's pictures of you on the network. And never again will you get work. You're dressed. In drag, there was quite a tag in a box. There's no room for two. Oh my, oh my, I'm heading for the top. I fight. Dirty, and I can't seem to stop. It couldn't get more absurder. I'm contemplating murder. I'll be okay, just like OJ in a box. There's no room for two. Jeez. <laughs> high hopes, high hopes, what is a guy to do? One box opens, uh, who do I have to screw? For me to go any higher, I must become a liar, but I will not stop till I'm on top in a box. There's no room for two. <laughs> All right, everybody try this too. It's how hard can this be? Good news, good news. I'm finally on the top. From this vantage, all I can do is drop. I cannot trust anybody. The path I left is bloody. Though I have won, it wasn't fun. In a box, there's no room for two. In a box, there's no room for two. My name is Jim. I'll see you at the next Biffaholic meeting.